As a physician, I can tell you that medicine is a wonderful art, but it is in trouble. Every day when we go to work, we are acutely aware of some troubling facts. About 30% of the care that we will provide is going to be futile, no value added. About 50% of the care that we should be providing will be overlooked or missed. And the third cause of death is not diabetes or road accidents. It's the honest errors that we do as physicians working in a system that does not account to the fact that we are humans. And humans make mistakes. We all deserve more. We have to find a way to inject more accuracy, more precision into these work processes. Imagine just for a moment that you had a gift, that you could look into the future, that you can look at someone and know that something bad is going to happen to them and that you could take him on a different course, take him out of harm's way. Wouldn't that be great? What would healthcare look like in a system like that when this is reality? Maybe instead of going to your physician with your ailments, you will actually receive a call from her. Hi, how are you doing this morning? Great, you'll reply. Good, don't be alarmed, but our data suggests that within six hours you're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> so don't you come into the clinic and we'll fix that. Wouldn't that be great? Sounds like science fiction, but it's not. This type of preemptive care is actually being provided in some countries, at least in the country where I come from, in Israel, it happens in massive scale every day. Let's take one example. Some of you have friends or family with renal failure, going through chronic dialysis. You know how painful and debilitating this condition is and how wonderful it would be if you could have prevented this from happening to them. If you could have come when they were asymptomatic, when they showed no symptoms, and tell them where they're heading and prevent it. At that point, when there's no symptoms, treatment prevention is quite easy, with few adverse events and very cheap. But you need to know who is actually going to be in this condition in five years from now. So you need a lot of data to do that, which is exactly what we did. We work in a system, fortunately, that has had electronic medical records for over two decades. And all of this data comes into a central data warehouse where it is completely available, EMR data and claims data available for the mining to do good things. And so we were able to create a predictive model that tells for every patient five years from now who it is, who are those who are going to be in renal failure. And we could ask our physicians to outreach to them, which we did, and they did. And what we see today is the beginning of the bending of the curve of new dialysis cases. We are doing this today to more and more diseases. We're doing this for diabetes. We're doing this for the readmission. We're doing this even for winter pneumonia. But it's not enough to have the data. You need to have the skill set in order to allow data analysis on real-world data. This is not simple. So we gathered some of the best talents uh, in, in the country, data scientists, physicians, epidemiologists, all working together trying to, tr to do these types of predictive models. And it by now became pretty easy to create a model if you're willing to accept a black box. So black box models are pretty now easy to create, but there's a problem because physicians don't like black boxes. They don't trust them. So we try to reverse engineer some of these models in order to understand what it is about them that puts the people in risk. Let me give you one example uh, how this actually works. So at some point, we wanted to predict who are the patients that are going to have osteoporotic fractures. That's where the bones become brittle and tend to break. And so the model insisted, the algorithm insisted that there was a strong association with eye disease. Now, I went to med school, I know. There's nothing associated between eye diseases and brittle bones. That is, has to be something faulty with the algorithm. But the algorithm insisted. And then suddenly it hit us. It's not that the eye diseases are associated with brittle bones. People who don't see well fall. And when they fall, they break. So this is what's nice about these types of augmentation that algorithms can help us supporting our work go beyond the trivial. 
physicians are great in facilitating these processes, but I want to ask you, can we try and bring some of this predictive data directly to the patients? We are making a bold move on that, and we are trying to address our cr chronically ill patients that are usually getting, they have several chronic diseases at once, that's multimorbidity is the new normal, and they have a lot of conflicting recommendations, and we want to help them make the choice, their healthy choices. We call this approach ideal health, and I want to show you a quick video that explains what this looks like. Sound. No sound. Okay. Is there any way to... I think you get it. So what we are trying to do, what you see here on the screen, is how the patient he can use his own data from his own medical record and his own personal predictive modeling that is based on causal inference to try and see what his risks are for serious diseases that he's worried about, in this case, stroke. And then, after he does that and he sees his risk, he can change different, do what-if scenarios. He can change some of his modalities, you know, lose weight, or maybe, in this case, it reduces his risk. And now he will be trying to see what happens if he stops smoking. Well if he stops smoking, the impact on his future risk is much more dramatic. So we can make his own decision what it is that he wants to do. And then, choose the goal. And what happens then is that, you see, his goal is to quit smoking. And then, there's a set of recommendations which the physician can then approve, including giving uh, adequate therapeutic treatment, going for gr uh, group therapy, um, and you can see that the prescription goes directly online to the pharmacy, and the patient can get it, and there's re then also the uh, support groups are appearing on their calendars. And so, this type of approach takes the predictive modeling and putting it into the hands of every patient. And so, we've done it in a small group, and uh, in a month from now, this goes live to our entire patient population. And basically, this approach really does give us an opportunity to help patients make smarter decisions. We've heard the talk with, from Dave, you know, nothing about me without me. But it's not just about empowering patients. We don't have much of a choice. Take radiology, we've talked about it a lot. There's no reason for us to force physicians to do repetitive technical work that algorithms can do better than them. Whatever a computer can do better, it should. Not only that, not only they can try to uh, uh, replicate what physicians do, nowadays we've been able to actually do things that physicians sometimes cannot do. For instance, look at this CT, look at the bone and say whether or not there's going to be an osteoporotic fracture based on what you see here. So basically, with, with the help of a startup company, Zebra Medical Vision, we're working with, we've been able to actually be able to predict osteoporosis based on the image alone. So this is something neat that can take us forward. So, we understand that there's only moving forward in this direction. So why do we still have clinics that look just like 50 years ago? How many of you, when they go to get care, get any of these wonderful things that we've heard about in the uh, day and a half that we've passed, in the days that we will over see in the few days? Why? Why are we so conservative? Some will say it's the incentive structure, but that's not the only answer. In order to get an answer, let's try to see uh, a different uh, profession and see how they are doing. Um, what would be the other conservative scientific field that you would imagine? Not this one. But actually, NASA is sending to space what they call dinosaur chips from over a decade ago. That's not because they don't have access to better technology, but because they want to be careful, because of the impact of things going into space. Now, those dinosaur chips is the same logic that makes us be careful when we introduce new technology into healthcare. There's as an epidemiologist, I can tell you, there's a huge difference between what makes sense and what actually works in a complex adaptive system, like the health system, like the human body. This, in many cases, does not work like you expect. There's unintended consequences. I'll give you, you know, the most basic thing is the new sensors. We are all engulfed with, with uh, offers of new sensors. Be 
weary if you don't take a look at the entire scope of care because unwarranted tests without clear impact on patients' outcomes is going to be into futile workups and complications that are avoidable. We already have so much over-treatment, over-diagnosis. Why make it worse? So just take into account this chasm is not so easy to cross, even with new technology. And you know there's an equation. You take old organizations, you put new technology, what do you get? Costly old organizations. So think the way through. Now, enough about diagnosis. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. You know the treatment is like walking a wire. Think about anticoagulation. Too little is dangerous. Too much is risky as well. There's a very delicate balance point, and that balance point is personal. But we make this decision based on data that was published in medical articles, and those articles take data on average. But I'm not average, and this patient is not average. None of us is average. So we want to get treatment according to our own data. And now we can benefit from the cumulative experience of many thousands of doctors that have seen millions of patients before us. And we can identify within this data the patients that look just like the one that is in front of us, and we can see what worked for them and what did not and make decisions based on that. And this is not just theory. Let me show you one way of putting this into practice. So this example has been done as part of the New England Journal of Medicine competition on what was called the Sprint Challenge, where they gave us uh, uh, a bunch of data on hypertensive uh, patients. And there was an intensive treatment group and the non-intensive treatment group. And that was a very famous trial. And we tried to do something different with it. And what we've actually did is we did uh, thousands of models for each patient by which we understood for that specific patient what would be the modeled benefits for them for every potential outcome. It will reduce this much of the risk of acute myocardial infarction. It will reduce this much the risk of cardiovascular death. But that's not enough. We then modeled the same way some of the adverse events. So yes, you reduce the risk of stroke, but no, you increase dramatically the serious risk of acute renal failure. So looking at this picture, what do you choose? Do you want to get the intensive treatment? I think the answer in this case is pretty simple. And so for every single patient in that cohort, we calculated this um, uh, equilibrium. And we said those that you should get treated and those that should probably do not. And we found out that over half of that cohort based on this data, should not have been getting this treatment, despite the fact the average treatment effect was good. This is moving from average treatment to personalized treatment. And that's just based on what's already available to us in uh, uh, clinical trial data. And the same thing can be done with real-world data. So this got you know, the first prize in, in the, the uh, uh, New England Journal Challenge. But the reason uh, I think that it was uh, uh, well um, taken is because we put it into a very simple approach. You see, you put the patient data in this, these boxes, or you get it directly from the electronic medical record, you hit calculate risk, and you get this very clear to understand image, as well as a bottom line recommendation. So there you have it. The algorithm does it all for you. Precision medicine at its best. Do you think this is the type of care we should probably take? And I think we should think twice. There's something missing here. I'm sure you feel it, right? We are not the sum of our biological traits. This care that I've just explained about is very precise, but it's not personalized. We, as a person, are more than our biologics. And if we want to make treatment personal, we have to make it directed to what the patient needs their needs, their preferences, their goals. This is the way that we should provide care, and not just based on this. But there's good news there. Yes, uh, the physician uh, can try to adapt in his head some of these uh, preferences of the physician, but also there is a way which we introduced into this approach that you can put it into the algorithms. Basically, what we've done is add weights that the patient and physician can discuss and discuss what it is that they fear more and what it is that they want to avert versus some of the other outcomes. And you get different outcomes according to different patient preferences. 
Because if you don't do that, you don't get a impartial assessment of what the patient should get. One of my most favorable um, TED Talks that I've seen is by Kathy O'Neill, and she says the following sentence, which I think we should all remember. Algorithms are not impartial judges. They're opinions embedded in code. And they are. Because what we've done, before we added this component into our system, we decided what the patient should be weary of and what he should not. We decided if they were looking for quality of life or for uh, uh, prolonging life. And we shouldn't. We should put them as part of this process. And we can, today, put the patient's voice into the algorithm. We can embed their preferences and opinion into the algorithms in order to get truly personalized, yet precise care. One of my uh, favorite quotes is by one of the most prominent physicians of all time, Sir William Osler. It was quite a while ago when he said, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science and not an art. So, now that we can account for the variability between patients, and we can do it in a precise way, we are actually turning medicine more and more from art to science. And that has a great potential to improve the care of our patients. So, health systems will not be replaced by algorithms, rest assured. But health systems that do not use algorithms will be replaced by those who do. And that will happen soon enough. So of all of you trying to run away from change, it will catch up. And you'll have a Kodak moment. So th this is not really about uh, who's better. Is it Holmes or Watson? Is it Dr. House or DeepMind? This is about bringing medicine back to the physician's hands, taking away from them the repetitive tasks that now haunt their daily profession and bringing them back to do what they're really good at, making the inferences that no computer can do, but also putting in the secret sauce the one thing that it will take quite a while before algorithms can do, and that makes all of the difference in repetitive clinical trials, have shown to be one of the most important and impactful features of the care that we provide to improve the patient's outcome. And that thing is pretty safe and will not be replaced by algorithms anytime soon. And that is the human touch. Thank you. Awesome. Todaraba, tour de force. Thank you. Um, so, I loved your message there. The challenge is we, lot, we have a lot of healthcare systems in the room and beyond. Some of them are maybe in the dinosaur era. How, what are the lessons that you've learned there to integrate some of this data into real clinical care and the barriers and misaligned incentives? Uh, how do you shift that? So, I, I think one of the most important lessons learned was work with the physicians. If you think you're going to bring to them the next new gadget or algorithm or decision support and force it on them while it will take more effort and energy for them to actually practice care because of your addition, forget it. They will not buy in. You have to work through their work processes. Make sure that this not only provides better care, but it makes their life as professionals better and makes them feel like they're on top of their profession. If you'll do that, they will go 100% along with you. If you try to force it on them, you will fail. So John Holomka mentioned often it's about incentives and paying folks, but what about the workflow? How do you get this into the workflow of a clinician who's busy, overwhelmed with data? So you need to ask yourself, what is the single piece of information the, patient, the physician needs at a single point in time? The last thing that they need from you is more data. Mm -hmm. They're dying from too much data already on, you know, uh, on their cognitive uh, uh, weight that they have and doing, providing their services already. 
What they want you is to make things more simple for them, not more complex. So try to have your UX uh, appropriate for their daily work. Bring the data to them when they need to and make it be actionable. Not just the data, but what they're supposed to do and why it should work. You do that, you have them with you. And how do we help the big EMR systems uh, make that happen? Wow, I'm underpaid to answer that question. Um, uh, what we are doing is, uh, by now, we are still working with our homegrown EMR system. So we're not working with the big vendors. So that makes it life a little bit more simple for us. I think when you ask um, that question about the big vendors, the question is always the Willie Sutton rule. Do you know why he robbed the banks? Because mm, that's, that's where the money was. Right. So I think if patient outcomes would be where the money is, I think that more and more players in this arena will come and focus on the main target. Great. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you. Thanks.